You've been to the sermon. If you picked up a copy of the bulletin, you will notice that the uh, bulletin contains an article that serves as an outline or at least a summary of the lesson. So if you uh, don't have a copy of the news and notes, uh, Robert will hand one to you if you'll raise your hand if you need a copy of the bulletin. And as indicated by the title of the article, we're going to continue our study of the findings within in reference to the problems of the church in Corinth. The church in Corinth was and continues to be notorious for the sins, not only that were committed there, but for the way that the church reacted to the sins, to the incidents, the pressures, the problems, temptations, and so forth that came their way, and the Apostle Paul spends as much time addressing how they reacted to the sins than the sin itself. So we're going to continue this and conclude our series of four lessons this morning as we consider three more problems that they had there in the church in Corinth. If you take a look at the first paragraph or two of the bulletin, You'll see there an outline of the previous lessons. We pointed out the finality of the members of the church there. And I'm not going to go into any detail explaining these. You have the information in the outline. And by the way, that final bulletin on this series of lessons will serve as a good outline that you might want to hang on to for the book of 1 Corinthians in reference to and divided up by the problems that they dealt with. So it was carnality was a problem. Chapters 1 through chapter 4. Immorality. <laughs> Contentions. Marriage issues. Christian liberty. Paying the preacher was an issue there that Paul dealt with. Temptation. How they dealt with temptation. The need to do better than their Old Testament counterparts who failed with every temptation that came their way, particularly while they were in the wilderness. Then there was the divine order that we talked about last week that's based upon, and the lesson of the divine order of God, the divine order of headship, is brought about in chapter 11 through the use of a custom, apparently, that was common in Corinth at the time concerning the covenant that the women were not wearing. And he goes into some detail explaining, offering reasons why the women should wear a covering on their head, which was a sign of subjection to man. Today we're going to go into the next problem described here in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians. And that was the difficulty or the problem, the sin of irreverence. The latter part of chapter 11 talks about this, beginning in verse 17. So if you would read along with me, we'll read the first part of this text. Beginning in verse 17, we'll read through verse 22. Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, so that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. Why do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. The church there in Corinth had desecrated the Lord's Supper. They had abused the Lord's Supper. They had turned the Lord's Supper into a, a factious, raucous, almost a, a drunken party, a drunken festival. People were being ignored. Other people were acting as gluttons. There was nothing 
about what they were doing that could be described as communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. They were not remembering the Lord Jesus Christ, and they certainly were not honoring the Lord Jesus Christ as they were partaking of this meal that was supposed to have been the Lord's Supper. When Paul says that uh, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, that was a reference there because it should have been to eat the Lord's Supper. But yet they were not doing that. And they turned the Lord's Supper into a festival of riot and abuse that was desecrating what the Lord's Supper was intended to be. Look in there at verse 17. He points out that our meeting together, such as it is this morning, as we were gathered together to worship God, to take of the Lord's Supper, and sing together, and pray together. All these things are supposed to be for the better and not the worse. I remember my father often prayed in public assembly that our gathering together would be for the better and not for the worse. But in Corinth, their gathering together was for the worse because they had abused the very reason why they came together. As Acts chapter 20 points out, they were to come together to partake of the Lord's Supper. He says when they come together as a church, there were divisions among them. They were causing those divisions. And Paul, because their reputation already established for factions and trouble, he believed the rumors that he heard about their problems. Verse 18, or 19, he points out an interesting thing about factions. Factions are not good, but one thing they do is that they approve those who are approved or recognized. If there is a faction or a fight or a disagreement within a local congregation and it's discussed and conclusions are drawn, then it's going to be revealed who's wrong and who's right. So he says there is a, a good result of factions within a local congregation. Issues are brought forward and the truth is revealed. And those who are right are exposed and those who are right are honored. Verse 20, therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, because in eating, one takes his own supper ahead of others. It was a greedy, you know, dog eat dog, every man for himself type of a situation. One is hungry and another is drunk. Then he says, don't you have houses to eat in? If you're going to turn the Lord's Supper into a common meal, especially one that's characterized in this raucous manner, do that at home. The Lord's worship assembly is not the place for carrying on this type of meal, this type of eating, this type of behavior. And he says that what they are doing is despising the church of God and shaming those who have nothing, those who had less than others, those who had were indulgent, and those who had nothing were probably feeling ashamed because they didn't have as much as the others. And he says, I will not praise you in these things. I don't guess we've ever, I know I haven't, witnessed such a scene that's described here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But we have observed the same irreverent attitude in modern day churches in reference to partaking of the Lord's Supper. Carelessness, indifference, empty formality, whispering, yawning, laughing, not paying attention to what we're doing, often characterize the observance of the Lord's Supper yet today in churches, maybe even to some extent in this congregation here, and other churches as well. But coming together to take the Lord's Supper is a serious matter. And we need to make sure we do that with the right attitude. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and verse 27 beginning. He says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. What does that mean? To be guilty of the body and blood means we're guilty of putting Jesus to death. But let a man examine himself and let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So this is a serious situation that's being addressed here in 1 Corinthians 11, beginning at verse 17, the taking of the Lord's Supper 
should be the central focus of our mind during this communion service. We should not be thinking about other things. We should understand why Jesus died, the nature of his death, the purpose of his death. Imagine in our minds, as it goes back to that cross, what he was suffering at the time, and discern the Lord's body and what it meant. John pointed out this morning as he presided over the Lord's Supper that uh, Jesus was not just a man who died, he was the Son of God, he was deity that died on that cross. And we need to discern that to the best of our ability, to discern and understand and appreciate what that means. The communion of the body and the blood of Jesus many times becomes commonplace to too many people. And irreverence is a problem now, just as it was in first in, in Corinth, as, this, as pointed out here in First Corinthians chapter 11. These people could be characterized as Paul characterized such people in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 19, where he says, Those whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. This goes back to the carnality of the members of the church there in Corinth. And we point out that their carnality was really the root of many of their problems. Not just the three expressions of carnality that we read about in chapters 1 through 4. When we talked about that point. But showing your reverence and uh, indifference toward the Lord's Supper. Not taking it seriously. Not thinking about it. Discerning the Lord's body. And understanding what it meant, that can be based, if we are guilty of that, upon our own carnality. These people were serving their own bellies. Their God was their belly. That's why he describes their feast there, not a spiritual feast honoring Christ, but a feast where they were greedy, indulging themselves, boarding themselves on food while others went hungry. Their God indeed was their belly. These people needed something physical in nature to attract their attention. Apparently to them, the protection of the Lord's Supper was not exciting enough because it had nothing to do with fulfilling the lust of the flesh or the desires of the flesh. They were simply there to observe a spiritual feast and that wasn't enough for them. And so they became indifferent toward it and even worse. Have you ever noticed anybody, if they were hungry coming to the dinner table, or the supper table in your home and falling asleep just before they sit down to eat? No, that doesn't happen because they're there to engage in a physical feast, to uh, take care of their physical appetite, to feed their belly. So people don't get upset. That's why the, the, the condemnation here in First Corinthians were not people falling asleep, but people who are engaged in feeding their bellies not concerned about Christ, not concerned about one another. And certainly they deserve the condemnation that's placed upon them here. So the problem was severe. And we do not want to eat and drink damnation to ourselves in reference to the Lord's Supper. So we need to take the warning that is mentioned here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We continue on in our discussion of the problems of the church in Corinth from the irreverence that they showed in partaking of the Lord's Supper to the ignorance that they showed, as chapters 12 through 14 point out, within the context of the spiritual gifts that they were given. Ignorance rests at the very root of many problems and difficulties and sins that people commit. The Apostle Paul recognized that in chapter 12 in the very first verse where he says, now concerning the spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. So he's teaching them something that they were ignorant of. Unfortunately, they shouldn't have been ignorant, but they were. And he has to teach them, yet again, what they needed to know about spiritual gifts. He spends 84 verses in chapters 12 through 14 teaching them about spiritual gifts, what the purpose of the gifts are, the endurance of spiritual gifts, and how they are to be used within the public worship assembly. But over in chapter 14, and verse 28, he says, but it 
But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. That's chapter 14 and verse 38. So apparently there were some there that were not going to learn. They were going to be ignorant and they were going to stay ignorant. And sometimes that happens. You can beat a horse to water, as I said, but you can't make him drink. You can teach the word of God to someone in person. You can teach the word of God to someone in a letter, as the apostle Paul did. You can send others to this city to teach them the word of God, but some were just not going to listen. And they were going to remain in their ignorance. So, apparently there were some there that had no hope of learning the proper use of spiritual gifts as Paul was teaching them here in chapters 12 through 14. There's really too much to cover in this lesson that's covered in chapters 12 through 14. So I'm not going to try to cover everything. But one point that I do want to make that needs to be made that was explained and established by Paul and even emphasized by him which is also much needed today in reference to spiritual gifts. And that is the use of spiritual gifts were not a sign of spiritual superiority on the part of anyone in the church. And today, the supposed use of spiritual gifts should not be seen or used as a sign of spiritual superiority as some do. Also, the folly of such present day tongue speakers and miracle workers is also exposed. In chapter 13, verse 8 beginning, he points out that miracles were going to end at some point. And those who speak in tongues or claim to speak in tongues and perform miracles today have never gotten that. They're still ignorant of what this context teaches in terms of how long spiritual gifts were to last. But let me give a brief summary of what Paul teaches here in these chapters. In chapter 12, he begins talking about the diversity of the gifts. There are nine spiritual gifts listed here. I don't know if this is all of them. I don't know of any other spiritual gifts that are listed anywhere else that go beyond these, but we don't know for sure. But there were nine spiritual gifts listed here. All are needed and all were given by the Holy Spirit. Notice what he says there in chapter 12 in verse 7 beginning. He lists those nine spiritual gifts. And then he says in verse 11, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Who distributed the gifts of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit did. The gifts of the Spirit were delivered by and distributed by the Holy Spirit to each individual as he will, as the Holy Spirit wills. People seem to overlook that. That the gift of the Holy Spirit, whatever it might be, back at that time did not come because somebody conjured it up out of their imagination or out of their great desire to have spiritual gifts. If they had the spiritual gifts, the Holy Spirit intended and gave it to them specifically. People today even seem to overlook that. The spiritual gifts were always or also needed to maintain the unity of the church. The entire context of chapters 12 through chapter 14 talks about the unity and the education and the edification of the church. Look at chapter 13 and verse 3 for just a moment. But he who prophesies, which of course was the most desirable spiritual gift, as he points out here, speaks edification and exhortation and comfort. So the purpose of spiritual gifts was to maintain the unity of the church. As he says in chapter 12, beginning at verse 12, and also to edify, to exhort, and to comfort. Verse 12 of chapter 12 says, For the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. So he is talking there about the unity of the church. Every member in the local church working together in a unified, peaceful fashion, everybody supplying their own talents, their own gifts, their own abilities, their own effort to maintain the unity of the church and to make sure that teaching or edification and comforting was being accomplished. People were being exhorted as well. But yet these people were not doing that. In fact, they were doing just the opposite. They were destroying the unity of the church, just like they did in how they partook of the Lord's Supper. Just like they did when they 
honored some men over others in chapter 1 based on their carnality. So they were destroying the very things for which the gospel was written to Christians to unify, to cause peace, that people would be taught, edified, and comforted. But that was not being done. Just the opposite was being done. Chapter 13 again goes on to talk about the importance of love in the use of spiritual gifts. Chapter 12, verse 31 says, But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. There was a more excellent way, believe it or not, than to be able to use miracles. There's something better in the accomplishing God's purpose for individual Christians and for a local church than performing miracles, regardless of what those spiritual gifts or miracles might be. Can you imagine that? If you could perform miracles, there'd be something better than that? Well, that's exactly what Paul's saying. In that better way, that more excellent way, is the way of love. Spiritual gifts... Any of the nine that are listed here would be worthless without love. They would not accomplish anything except for what was bad. Look what he says in chapter 13, verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, they have not love. I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Discordant using would be the theme of the church if all they have was spiritual, uh, spiritual gifts. Without love, it would not accomplish anything but disorder. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. The greatest knowledge, the greatest gift of prophecy, the greatest faith to move mountains would not accomplish anything good for God's people if not accompanied by love. And if you bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, promise me nothing. No measure of sacrifice or giving in terms of benevolence would accomplish what God wants to accomplish without love. So we have to understand the primary importance, the preeminent position of love in all that we do toward God, toward one another toward the church, toward the world. We must make sure that love is what we are emphasizing. Not our own talents, not our own abilities, any of them miraculous in nature. That's not what God considers to be important. Love is what's important. Then he goes on in chapter 13 and talk about the shortened endurance of spiritual gifts. He says, love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, that's uh, miraculous knowledge, it will vanish away. These things are not going to be lasting. So brethren, they are pouring. If they are putting all their eggs in the basket of their spiritual gifts, pretty soon those gifts will only be gone. And if they didn't have love, they would have nothing. They'd be left with nothing. And the same thing goes for us as well. Chapter 12. Beginning verse 12 talks about the talents and abilities that every person has. Some of them could have been miraculous, obviously they were, others may not have been miraculous. We have gifts and talents and abilities and work within the context of the local church. That's not miraculous in nature. But we still need to make sure that love is overgirding, undergirding all that we do <coughs> so that our work will not be in vain. It's ironic, both well, chapter 14 then goes on to point out that edification and comfort and exhortation was the purpose of these gifts. And uh, again, chapter 14, verse 3 says that he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort. That's what has to be accomplished by the use of spiritual gifts within the local church back in Corinth. And that has to be accomplished today. It's accomplished through the Word, that which is perfect. That he talks about in chapter 13 is a complete revelation of God's Word. But I can't go into detail explaining the argumentation involved with that, but you've heard it before. And so we still have the purpose of edifying, exhorting, and comforting one another. And their use of spiritual gifts, as chapter 14 points out, was being abused. Again, they were putting this themselves first. They were doing so selfishly. And they were doing so in uh, uh, ignorance of what the purpose of the gifts were. And they were also <coughs> ignoring other people. And their value in teaching. 
All those things were brought out in chapter 14 in terms of the mistakes and sins that they were committing in reference to their use of the uh, of their spiritual gifts. So they failed to understand the purpose of the gifts. Chapter 14 and verse 1 says, Pure, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, and especially that you may prophesy. Then in verse 3, Edification, exhortation, and comfort is a purpose. And there's several passages, verses 3 through 5, chapter 14, verse 12. Also, verses 18 through 19. Talk about the purpose of the spiritual gifts being to teach, to edify, to encourage, to build up, to promote unity. And they're overlooking that. Another failure is that they were satisfied with a limited revelation of truth. He points out, as we did in chapter 13, verse 8, beginning, that the spiritual gifts were not going to last forever. They were going to come to an end. So the Christians in Corinth in the first century failed to understand that. They failed to understand the purpose of the gifts, number one. They were, number two, they were satisfied with a limited revelation of truth, which Paul describes as being childlike. And uh, they were condemned because of that, chapter 14 and verse 20. And then they failed to consider previous revelation. Look at chapter 14 and verse 13. This puts a whole new uh, context, or puts spiritual gifts in a whole new context. It's very important. Chapter 14 and verse 32 says, But the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. What does that mean? The spiritual gifts are subject to the teaching of the prophets. If you're in your spiritual gift or teaching or producing something that's not in keeping with what's already been revealed, then you're off track. You use the spiritual gifts to accomplish the wrong thing. You're accomplishing just the opposite of what's already been taught. So you compare what you accomplish with the spiritual gift, Paul teaches them, with what's already been revealed, what you already know is truth. Just like Paul says in Galatians chapter, uh, chapter 1, they uh, had come up with a new gospel, which was not a gospel at all. When they went astray from that which has already been revealed. Chapter 30, 14, verse 37 and 38 again says, If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. Their spiritual gifts were on one hand, if they were accomplishing things or teaching things that were not true, or if they were, if their use of the gifts were promoting disunity in the church, he refers to the commandments and the knowledge that they had received that came from the Lord. And in verse 38, if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. We cannot use our talents and abilities and gifts as great as they might be, even if they're miraculous, if we're not using them according to what's been revealed already. All the way to do has to be based upon the revelation of God's word. And they had failed to understand that there in the church in Corinth. Now out to the uh, final sin we're going to discover. And I'm not sure if there's any others or probably others that we've overlooked or not included in this particular series of lessons. But chapter 15, the final, uh, not the final chapter, but the uh, chapter that's most important maybe, no chapter any more important than chapter 15, of 1 Corinthians, because it talks about the very heart of the gospel, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Their apostasy in this was that they had denied, some of them had denied the resurrection. Look at chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. He said, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. So that was the established point that Paul's trying to make here, 1 Corinthians 15, that they, many of them, had failed to understand and had denied the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But in denying the resurrection of Christ, they were also denying the greatest hope of Christians. And that is our own resurrection. And our hope of heaven when this life is over. Look at verse 12 of chapter 15. 
Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? So they were denying the resurrection either of Christ or of themselves. But they were also denying, in denying the resurrection of Christ, their own resurrection and the hope of eternal life. So Paul, here in chapter 15 and verse 1, he defends this hope of our own resurrection. Based upon the resurrection of Christ, he establishes that. He points it out as a fact in verses 1 through 4. Then in verses 5 through 7, he offers witnesses, many witnesses, to the resurrection body of Jesus Christ. Then in verses 8 through 11, he gives his own testimony as a, uh, as a witness, an apostle called out of due season, one who was untimely born, the fact that he saw Jesus on that road to Damascus. Then he goes on to emphasize the importance of the doctrine of the resurrection to the life of every Christian. And he also talks about the resurrection body in verses 37 through 57. So he points out the importance of the resurrection to the Christian, the very foundation. Jesus was declared to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Romans chapter 1 and verse 4. It is the foundation of the claims of Christ to be God. And it's also the basis and the foundation for our faith in Jesus Christ as God. You take the resurrected Jesus Christ out of Christianity, you destroy Christianity, and there were obviously some there in the city of Corinth, in the church there, who had done just that. But in conclusion, let's turn to the very next verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and that is verse 58. And I can't think of any better way to conclude this series of lessons on what's been revealed to the church there, which is also being revealed to you and I even yet today, and when we pick up our Bibles and read 1st and 2nd Corinthians. The Apostle Paul says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Our labor has to be based upon truth, that which has been revealed. And if it is, we need to work as hard as we can, laboring to teach that truth and to apply that truth to our lives with a full faith and assurance that our labor will not be in vain in the Lord. Pick up your hymn books at this time and turn to the number that Josh has selected in the song of invitation. If you're subject to respond to the invitation, either the child of God who needs to come forward in repentance, maybe there's something that's been said during this series of lessons that has revealed some sin on your part. Maybe you're guilty of one of these problems that the Christians in Corinth had. If so, we urge you to come forward, ask for our prayers to God, that you might be restored to a greater portion of health, that you will be restored to faithfulness. And if there's any among our number that need to respond to the invitation by becoming a Christian, the invitation is offered to you at this time. We encourage you to come as together we stand and as we see.